The causation doctrine can be boiled down to the question of whether the defendant's illegal action was an operating and substantial cause of the harm which resulted. This was set down in R versus Cheshire 1991. In this case, the defendant shot a man in the stomach and thigh. The man was taken to the hospital where he was operated on and developed breathing difficulties. The hospital gave him trichotomy, a tube inserted into the windpipe connected to a ventilator. Several weeks later, his wounds were healing and no longer life-threatening. However, he continued to have breathing difficulty and he died from complications arising from the trichotomy. The defendant was convicted of murder and he appealed. His conviction was upheld despite the fact that the wounds were not the operative cause of death. Intervening medical treatment could only be regarded as excluding the responsibility of the defendant if it was so independent of the defendant's act and so potent in causing the death that the jury regard the defendant's act as insignificant. Since the defendant had shot the victim, this could not be regarded as insignificant. It would be a mistake to think that this explains it on its own though. This is a legal question rather than a factual one and depends on common sense and some moral reasoning rather than asking technical medical questions. So we start with the but for question. The question that the courts ask is, but for the defendant's action, would the harm have occurred? Think about R versus Cheshire and ask yourself this question. But for the defendant's shooting, would the victim's death have occurred? Think about the chain of the events. Victim was shot. He was operated on because he was shot. He developed breathing difficulties because he was operated on because he was shot. He was given trichotomy because he developed breathing difficulty because he was operated on because he was shot. I think you must have gotten my point by now. So if you look at the chain of the events, you will notice that the chain did not break at any point. Defendant's shooting caused the victim's death. Let's look at a contrasting example. John Herring uses the example of Albert poisoning Victoria, but Victoria dying of an unrelated heart attack before the poison takes effect. To put events the other way around, however, does make a difference. Shortening the life of someone with a terminal illness is causing their death because without the illegal conduct, they would not have died at the time and in those circumstances. The but for doctrine will however still involve a lot of potential causes. So we also ask about legal causation. That is, whether the defendant's action was an operating and substantial cause of the harm. This is most significant where the action or inaction of another person or the victim themselves changes the normal course of events. This is known as nervous actus intervenience, a new and intervening act. Professor Hart and Honor developed this principle using the distinction between those circumstances that are part of factual background or conditions and those that are causes. They point out that in order to start a fire, you need a drop match, oxygen and combustible material. But we would only consider the first to be the cause of that fire. Conditions in this case, oxygen and flammable materials, are normal whereas causes the drop match in this case are abnormal. And in their view, only abnormal things can be causes. The question is, of course, what is abnormal? Heart and Honor emphasize that only a free, voluntary and informed act of a third party can be abnormal and break the chain of causation. Think of a few situations. If a person is not acting voluntarily, their action will not be a novus actus intervenience, such as falling into another person when pushed and injuring them as well. In R v. Paget 1983, the appellant, age 31, had separated from his wife and formed a relationship with a 16-year-old girl. She became pregnant. She finished the relationship when she was six months pregnant because he was violent towards her. He did not take it very well and drove to her parents' house armed with a shotgun. He shot the father in the leg and took the mother at gunpoint and demanded she took him to where her daughter was. When there, after various threatening and violent behavior, he then took the girl. He drove off with the mother and the daughter. The police caught up with him and he kicked the mother out of the car and drove off with the daughter. He took her to a flat and kept her hostage. Armed police followed him. 
He used the girl as a shield as he came out of the flat and walked along the balcony. The police saw a figure walking towards them but could not see who it was. The appellant fired shots at the police and the police returned fire. The police shot the girl who then died. The appellant was convicted of possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life, kidnap of mother and daughter, attempted murder on the father and two police officers, and the manslaughter of the girl. He appealed against the manslaughter conviction on the issue of causation. But his conviction was upheld. The firing at the police officer caused them to fire back. In firing back, the police officers were acting in self-defense. Plus, the police officer was acting to enforce the law and so his action was not a novus actus intervenience. Appellant using the girl as a shield caused her death. Hart and Honor would say that such an obligation meant that the officer was not acting voluntarily. This particular idea has been criticized because someone owing a legal duty still makes a choice as to whether to obey that duty. What is your opinion on this? Is this a public policy exception or does a police officer really not have a choice? This would be a good discussion for an essay on causation. In R vs. Michael 1940, a mother gave her baby son's nurse some laudanum, telling her it was medicine for her son and intending the nurse to poison and kill him. The nurse put it on a shelf and forgot about it, but her child gave it to the baby and he died. The nurse had no knowledge of the bottle having poison in and the child was too young to be capable of criminal conduct. So the mother was found guilty of murder through the use of innocent agents. The act must also be enough to render the defendant's act no longer a substantial and operating cause. This is particularly important in criminal cases that involve the subsequent complication of medical negligence. An example would be the case of R v. Smith 1959. In this case, the defendant, a soldier, got in a fight at an army barrack and stabbed another soldier. The injured soldier was taken to the medics but was dropped twice en route. Once there, the treatment given was described as palpably wrong. They failed to diagnose that his lung had been punctured. The soldier died. The defendant was convicted of murder and appealed contending that if the victim had received the correct medical treatment, he would not have died. It was held that the stab wound was an operating cause of death and therefore the conviction was upheld. In such cases, the courts are reluctant to let defendants complain that their victim would have survived if they had received proper medical care. A rare case among such cases is R versus Jordan, in R v. Jordan 1956, the defendant stabbed the victim. The victim was taken to the hospital where he was given antibiotics after showing an allergic reaction to them. He was also given excessive amounts of intravenous liquids. He died of pneumonia eight days after admission to hospital. At the time of death, his wounds were starting to heal. It was held that victim died of the medical treatment and not the stab wound and the defendant was not liable for his death. As for the victim's action, the rule goes that where the act is of the victim, the chain of causation will not be broken unless the victim's actions are disproportionate or unreasonable in the circumstances. On this note, let's look at the case of R. Robert, 1971. A young woman accepted a lift from the defendant at a party to take her to another party. She had not met the man before and it was 3 a.m. The defendant drove in a different direction to where he told her he was taking her and then stopped in a remote place and started making sexual advances towards her. She refused his advances and he drove off at speed. He then started making further advances while driving and she jumped out of the moving car to escape him. She suffered from concussion and cuts and bruises. The defendant was convicted of actual bodily harm under Section 47 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. He appealed contending that he did not intend or foresee a risk of her suffering actual bodily harm from his actions and that he did not foresee the possibility of her jumping out of the car and therefore her actions amounted to a novus actus intervenience. It was held that there is no need to establish an intention or recklessness as to the level of force under Section 47. It is sufficient to establish that the defendant had intention or was reckless as to the assault or battery.
where the victim's actions were a natural result of the defendant's actions, it did not matter whether the defendant could foresee the results. Only where the victim's actions were so unexpected that no reasonable man could have expected it, would there be a break in the chain of causation.